And as soon as you, you feel you're ready, I would hire uh, someone to do more commercial work if it's a sales development person, business development, account executive, whatever. Uh, I would start having someone to just do it with a, a larger capacity. Nitan, I'm excited to continue our conversation. I'd love to hear your story a bit more in depth. You, you shared a little bit uh, of where you where you started, but tell me, where did you begin and how did you get to then where you are today with Epsigon? Where did I begin? Like from birth? I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. uh, I guess my professional career is, or like the going index started when I was, a kid, I had my first computer and I, I played a lot of PC games actually. I didn't do any programming as a kid. Uh, and then it really, but it made me go in high school to learn uh, programming. Uh, so that was the first um, introduction to the field. And then I went to do a computer engineering degree at the Technion in Israel. Uh, at that time, I also worked at Intel for about two years as a software developer uh, student. So that was really great experience, like as a for a very young, uh, I was like 19, start suddenly working in one of the most you know, successful companies in the world. Um, uh, it was a lot of fun and kind of made me realize the difference between the academia and the uh, industry. Uh, you know, it's very different. Um, yeah, then I finished the, the school. I went to the intelligence unit where I spent about seven years. I was an officer, a captain there. Uh, I did a master's degree at, at the Technion in, in computer science at the same time with a thesis in computer graphics, so like completely different domain. And as mentioned in the unit, I did work in cybersecurity and a lot of low-level stuff. So I was there uh, in different positions from research, development, and management, and working on some super exciting, uh, interesting projects with a lot of technology challenge and also very important to the kind of the national security and. Um, and in the unit, actually, that's where it all started, like thinking about starting a company because many of the people around me finished the service and started their own companies. Some of them, you know, exited in hundreds of millions or even billions. Some of them are active to, until today with hundreds of employees. So some of the best companies from Israel probably uh, started from that unit. So I knew that I would like to do the same thing at some point. I didn't know exactly when and what, but after the service, I, I went traveling for a year. I took a year off. Uh, I went to many countries, got back to Israel, and then I kind of had no money, had no uh, co-founder yet, so I couldn't just you know start something yet. I had, I really wanted to find a, a partner to do this with, so I started working at a startup company called uh, the Misto. Uh, later on, they got acquired by Palo Alto Networks, and I got this exposure to work a startup actually. You know, it's different working at Intel, the, the IDF, the, the Army. Um, and at the same time, I reconnected with my co-founder, Ron, who is the CTO. He was still in the unit. He was managing about 30 people back then. Um, and after, you know, spending some time working together on different projects, we kind of felt that there's a very good fit and we could actually see ourselves working together for years. And we decided to kind of quit whatever we were doing uh, to focus on the company. And that's how it really started. And as mentioned, we went into cloud infrastructure because we believe it's a, it's a very good opportunity. And yeah, that was about four year, uh, three years ago. Um, and then, you know, fundraising and all of that stuff. And I, I moved to New York this year, actually, after uh, spending about one year in Israel, one year in between Israel and the U.S., kind of half and half. And uh, this year, I, I made the move to come here. And I mean, regardless of the uh, whole COVID, that made it a bit less relevant. But even just the time difference is a huge difference. Like being in Israel and having a U.S. team is, is something I, I don't wish to anyone. <laughs> so I'm really happy I'm, I'm in the U.S. time zone right now. And it allowed us to hire some really good people here as well. It's quite a, a journey, um, but it, it's uh, the the stepping stones. I can see the natural progression that you wanted eventually. You got the bug when you saw everyone else going off, starting their companies. You knew you wanted to do this. On that journey of getting started, getting that initial funding, that that's a whole story, I'm sure, right there. Any tactics or tips or things that you learned to get that initial funding um, that you could share that another entrepreneur could learn from? 
about fundraising. Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, it's not like uh, such a scary thing if you think about it, because uh, the investors, they need to invest their their LPs money. If, you, if it's a VC or if it's an angel investor, you know, uh, different um, incentives, but, but still, you know, they want to invest. It's not like you're coming in a, in a, in a position you need it more than they, both of you need it in a similar way. Everyone has different uh, reasons. Uh, they have to show return on the money. They can't just sit on it without doing anything, right? So you need to remember it and you need, and then you need to understand what uh, they care about, which is typically uh, reducing their risk. So you need to, first, like, of course you need an actual problem that you're solving. That's like the first thing with regardless of raising money, just like if you want to build a company and it solves some problem, but assuming that there is a problem and it addresses a, a big market, if it's a smaller market, that's also fine. Maybe you don't need to raise money. Maybe you can raise a little less money from like an angel. But let's say it's a you know billions market, like the monitoring market. So we decided to do a, a, a sizable seed run. It was about four million, and I mean we raised almost thirty million to date. Uh, but the seed was not small. You may say, I mean it's, it's a decent round that can actually let you build a, an initial team and a product and sell even to the enterprise. So at that point, you know, you want to raise, you know, let's say $4 million. You, you know the VCs you want to go after. I mean, usually we went uh, and looked at the Israeli ecosystem. Eventually we had also Lightspeed, which is an international VC, but uh, with an Israeli office. So uh, basically you just need to have a plan. You know, you want to make sure you have a timeline for the fundraising, let's say a couple of weeks in which you do all the first meetings with investors then you need to line them up uh, you get introductions to whoever you need. I mean, it's really easy to get introductions to VCs because they are not hiding. I mean, the, it's their job to, to find you as well. So at least get the, the initial touch. It's not difficult at all. And, um, and then you need to build a story as mentioned that, is that really shows that the company you are building has as less risk as possible. So risk is typically, in the form of the market that's the first thing you really need to emphasize that this is a big market like if the vc doesn't think it's a big market it's just not no matter how good you are you're not able to you know to make a big outcome then you know the team very important you need to show them that you are very strong like really top percentile team like how, however you present it whoever you are you want to make sure this is the impression they're getting and and third is like what you do product technology today if you're a software company the risk there is pretty minimal because you don't need you know data centers you can do that use the cloud you can have an mvp in a matter of few months usually but if you have a very strong tech side which maybe you're doing something with uh, biology computation or even hardware or chemistry obviously you need to explain why you can even do what you say you'll do in our case you know there is a very strong technology challenge but nobody questioned our ability to you know to execute on it so that wasn't the risk the risk was really about um well, you know there are comp there is competition how are you going to be different how are you going to be able to, to create a large company but luckily you know right before our our series there, there was some great example of um you know they were going public signal effect acquired for one billion address went public so there are actually measurable results to start in this space like dog was obviously a success to their investors so um yeah um i'm happy to to chat with anyone who has those uh, concerns i think i helped some some entrepreneurs with like thinking about fundraising and making it much more structured rather than a scary thing I love your perspective on it, that it shouldn't be scary, that they're in, they're in their position to give money. You shouldn't feel bad that you're asking for it at the very beginning. And then about the story, making sure you have a captivating story, stating the risks clearly, that you understand the market, you have the team, a talented team, and you know that you can deliver on it. And you shouldn't, then you don't need to worry. I like it. It's a nice framework you just provided. Mm -hmm. Getting that initial customer you've got the funding and then you build your mvp 
what did it take any learning lessons learned of, of getting that initial few customers on board? What did that take? And what does it take? Uh, patience, uh, persistency. I mean, obviously nobody cares about you when you're small. Nobody cares about you when you're either, but especially when you're small, um, nobody's going to hear about you. Like it's just not, doesn't work this way. You have no, no brand awareness. No one just literally too few people heard of you. So you can't expect anything to happen. Uh, even you have the most amazing product and even if the problem you have is huge, again, nobody knows you. So if you are like three people in an office, right? So, I mean, obviously you want to start doing something, but uh, at the same time, you want to start sticking with customers as much as possible. I, I really see only the, only the benefit of it. So, I mean, we would go and do a lot of, you know, reach out customers, email, LinkedIn, whatever. We did it before the fundraising, but obviously after as well use your connections to get people to actually, you know, use your product. It's not the same as a, a, an outbound that you can actually grab and sell into, but even if it's to a friend, you know, eventually if you're, you're selling into businesses, they are not going to do you a favor and spend teams time to, to implement your product if it's not going to bring them any value. So it is, it does mean something when a company uh, usually more than one person uses your product, uh, even if it was through a friend's uh, introduction. It's, and until today, we have customers coming through our personal connections. Every time there is an opportunity, I mean, why not? Eventually, you want you want the foot in the door. You want you want people to, want people to know about you. It's just a way to do that. Uh, and as soon as you, you feel you're ready, I would hire uh, someone to do more commercial work if it's a sales development person business development, account executive, whatever, uh, I would start having someone to just do it with a, a larger capacity to, to start getting more and more meetings with customers because this eventually is the engine to everything. You get customers, you get revenue, you get feedback. Like you need the engagement with the customers. Go to conferences. If, if it's online, you know, even better, it's even cheaper. You can pay like a thousand bucks and get exposure to hundreds of companies. Uh, so it's really worth it. Um, so, you know, it just takes a lot of work and um, yeah. I appreciate that first takes patience and just a lot of conversations, but you make an excellent point that then building, get, getting a salesperson, building a, the right team is a great way then to scale up from there. What, what did, your team look like at the beginning and what does it look like today? So in the beginning, it's, um, you know, Ryan and I started, we hired some like very good engineers. We, we knew from the unit that we either, usually we work with them or we, we manage them. So actually one of them is now our director of engineering. He's managing the like multiple teams. The other one is the director of like a cloud architecture. So people that really grew with the company. Um, but we have the, the core engineering team. We really were in, in a, we had the luxury until today. We, we feel very lucky because we had, didn't have to use a recruiter uh, yet for the engineering goals. Because in Israel, we have a, really a very strong connection and people actually bring their friends. And we have maybe 15 to 20 engineers today and uh, very, very strong people. So we started with that. Uh, I think um, in the first, you know, six to 12 months, it was really mostly me and Ron trying to get into more customers. Um, basically, you know, we started with creating content as soon as we can. So we started to get some traffic to the website and, and then we decided strategically to open the product up uh, after less than a year to say it's GA and you can start and sign. And at that point, we really started to see the more traffic and more people using it. And we felt we are ready to bring the first salesperson. So that was about a year after the seed funding. We brought the first AE in San Francisco. And um, yeah, and then we, we, before the Series A, we grew the team to, I mean, we had people in the US and probably, you know, 12 in Israel. And most of them were engineering in Israel. And then uh, after Series A, we really could scale and we had a funding round after that. 
So we grew to about 40 today. We're grouped from 1A to ETM of 5 with a VP of sales, and we have a of marketing. Like we have a bunch of them now, uh, some of them from companies like Datadog or uh, New Relic. So, um, anyway, yeah, it's pretty natural evolution, but it goes together with the facing of the company. It's helpful to hear the timeline of that you know, first to, to six or eight months and then a year later and then to where you are today. There's all the stepping stones uh, to be able to get to where you are now. What did it take to truly then start to scale going from the first you know, 10, you know, 20 customers on the platform to hundreds or, or, or more? Uh, and any stats that you can share about like where you are now and, and, and then it just tactics that have got you to that? Um, yeah, I mean, the word viral is a bit uh, overused. I mean, we are not Instagram yet or TikTok, but uh, <laughs> I mean, we are still mostly an enterprise company. We have hundreds of customers today, which is, you know, it's not, it's not uh, little, but um, it's not also not like a consumer product or like a fully self zero touch, self serve zero touch product. So yeah, it started, as I mentioned, with having the first users on board or you some people call it design partners but i don't care about the term really it's about having people to use your product to provide feedback to see value even before talking about them paying or not it's good if they can pay but it's not like the main thing at the moment i mean at the beginning so we had like a few dozens um i don't know maybe 10 20 companies using the product to some extent before we opened opened it up to the public and at that point we also started to get uh, the first paying customers. Uh, only after that, we had the first, let's call it enterprise deal, which is a bigger deal that is, you know, uh, involving a longer sales cycle, usually, you know, uh, more than a month, let's say, and, uh, and starts to actually get some ARR into the company. And um, yeah, and then it kind of went hand in hand. We had the self-serve that started to work and we had the enterprise motion. And the goal is to get as many people from the self-serve to the enterprise. That's kind of uh, the reason to have a self-serve because the revenue coming from self-serve is, is usually not, in most companies in our, our type, is not going to be, let's say, more than, more than half or even more than 30%. But selling to a customer that already use your product for a month or two or six uh, if it's a large company, the sales cycle is extremely faster when you don't have to explain to them. You know, it's just a matter of, oh, we use this in one team. We want to deploy it across the board. We need a large contract. So you really go into a commercial discussion way faster. So that's really the core reason to have self-serve. That's a powerful uh, tactic to know that that works of uh, self-serve to get into the larger companies and then you can sell them. It's much easier to expand to the entire company. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something that uh, we are not the first, the only company to use the tactic, obviously. But yeah, it's definitely, if you can make it work, it really reduces your customer acquisition cost and makes all the other parameters much, much better, like all the SaaS metrics and so on. In the last, uh, in, in 2020, during COVID, what kind of challenges have you had both internally with your team and your culture, as well as externally with your clients and customers uh, as far as whether it's communication or just marketing efforts or just speaking internally and how are you addressing those challenges i think covid affected everyone in some way some people actually benefited from covid like uh, zoom i suppose but overall you know in our space we are in the infrastructure space so we are not targeting a specific vertical like travel or transportation or whatever so some of, our cust some of our potential customers have been impacted. So, you know, if we have a call with a company in the uh, travel industry or the, um, I don't know, exercise industry, uh, maybe that's not the best time for them. But at the same time, there are so many other companies that it's maybe business as usual or even more business right now, you know, e-commerce really picked up. So naturally we like, we saw other types of companies going into the funnel but I don't think in general uh, it necessarily impacted our ability to grow as planned. Uh, I mean, the good thing is that um, the, the existing customers didn't actually churn like any of them because 
I mean, if you think about it, unless the company really goes down completely, if they are still running, monitoring is, is a must have. They can't just disconnect uh, the monitoring solution. It's a really business critical thing. So we, it was really great to see that some companies, some of our customers asked for maybe some support or flexibility in payments, but there was no discussion about, you know, cutting apps are going out. Um, some of them asked for our business continuity plan to make sure we are not going to go down, which is actually pretty flattering. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it was really interesting to see the, the, let's call it the stability of the market, which we are in. Uh, so I'm, we're pretty happy to, to have chosen, you know, monitoring is what we do. Last two questions I have for you. Are there any books, podcasts, audiobooks that you have found helpful in growing and learning uh, yourself that you would, would recommend? Um, yeah, there are some famous ones that, you know, I guess maybe one that I'm actually listening to right now is really nice. It's called um, From Impossible to uh, Inevitable. It's really nice. It's by uh, the founder of um, Sus Suster. Anyway, it, it's an in, inaudible. It's nice. Um, I think some like the famous books from, you know, Ben Horowitz is really good. Hard things about hard things. And um, I really like uh, Crossing the Chasm. Um, Shoe Dog is really good. I mean, yeah, really, there are so many. Last question I have for you. What kind of tech innovations do you predict we'll see in the near term in the next year and long term, the next five, 10 years? Um, I'm going to refer to my space, like the DevOps and IT, because there are so many, obviously. But um, yeah, we see a lot of things happening in, you know, making things more automated, more just, you know, automating as much as possible. The deployment, the testing, the monitoring, the security. Um, there is generally a trend of shift left, which is making, you know, developers being in charge of more and more and more in the organization rather than the traditional IT ops. So every tool you, you build today, if it's for DevOps, for example, you have to think about the developers and you, just, you can't just think about the CIO. This is the way things work. You can, like, everything has to be almost a democracy in that matter. Um, so many things are happening over there. I mean, we were seeing a lot of security products that are end with suddenly a developer, which is something pretty, pretty unique. Um, in general, I think cloud, the cloud is like really in the beginning and it's going to be a lot of stuff going on there. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning or other technology to transform the way we live, work and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know.